Chapter Ten of *The Curse of Capistrano* by Johnston Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Ten: A Hint at Jealousy. Within the space of half an hour, Captain Ramon's wounded shoulder had been cleansed of blood and bandaged, and the captain was sitting at one end of the table, sipping wine and looking very white in the face and tired. Doña Catalina and Senorita Lolita had shown much sympathy, though the latter could scarcely refrain from smiling when she remembered the captain's boast regarding what he purposed doing to the highwaymen, and compared it to what had happened. Don Carlos was outdoing himself to make the captain feel at home, since it was well to seek influence with the army, and already had urged upon the officer that he remain at the hacienda a few days until his wound had healed. Having looked into the eyes of the senorita Lolita, the captain had answered that he would be glad to remain at least for a day, and, despite his wound, was attempting polite and witty conversation, yet failing miserably. Once more there could be heard the drumming of a horse's hoofs, and Don Carlos sent a servant to the door to open it so that the light would shine out, for they supposed that it was one of the soldiers returning the horseman came nearer and presently stopped before the house and the servant hurried out to care for the beast there passed a moment during which those inside the house heard nothing at all and then there were steps on the veranda and don diego vega hurried through the door ha he cried as if in relief i am rejoiced that you are all alive and well don diego the master of the house exclaimed you have ridden out from the pueblo a second time in one day no doubt i shall be ill because of it don diego said already i am feeling stiff and my back aches yet i felt that i must come there was an alarm in the pueblo and it was noised abroad that this senor zorro the highwayman had paid a visit to the hacienda i saw the soldiers ride furiously in this direction and fear came into my heart you understand don carlos i feel sure i understand caballero don carlos replied beaming upon him and glancing once at senorita lolita i uh, felt it my duty to make the journey and now i find that it has been made for naught you all are alive and well how does it happen lolita sniffed but don carlos was quick to make reply the fellow was here but he made his escape after running captain ramon through the shoulder ha don diego said collapsing into a chair so you have felt a steel eh captain that should feed your desire for vengeance your soldiers are after the rogue they are the captain replied shortly for he did not like to have it said that he had been defeated in combat they will continue to be after him until he is captured i have a big sergeant gonzales i think he is a friend of yours don diego who is eager to make the arrest and earn the governor's reward i shall instruct him when he returns to take his squad and pursue this highwayman until he has been dealt with properly let me express the hope that the soldiers will be successful senor the rogue has annoyed don carlos and the ladies and don carlos is my friend i would have all men know it don carlos beamed and doña catalina smiled bewitchingly but the senorita lolita fought to keep her pretty upper lip from curling with scorn a mug of your refreshing wine don carlos don diego vega continued i am fatigued twice to-day have i ridden here from reina de los angeles and it is about all a man can endure tis not much of a journey four miles said the captain possibly not for a rough soldier don diego replied but it is for a caballero may not a soldier be a caballero ramon asked nettled somewhat at the other's words it has happened before now but we come across it rarely don diego said he glanced at lolita as he spoke intending that she should take notice of his words 
for he had seen the manner in which the captain glanced at her, and jealousy was beginning to burn in his heart. "'Do you mean to insinuate, senor, that I am not of good blood?' Captain Ramon asked. "'I cannot reply as to that, senor, having seen none of it. No doubt this senor Zoro could tell me. He saw the color of it, I understand.' "'By the saints!' Captain Ramon cried. "'You would taunt me?' "'Never be taunted by the truth.' don diego observed he ran you through the shoulder eh no tis a mere scratch i doubt not should you not be at the presidio instructing your soldiers i await their return here the captain replied also it is a fatiguing journey from here to the presidio according to your own ideas senor but a soldier is in your to hardship senor true there are many pests you must encounter the captain said glancing at don diego with meaning you term me a pest, senor. Did I say as much? This was perilous ground, and Don Carlos had no mind to let an officer of the army and Don Diego Vega have trouble in his hacienda for fear he would get into greater difficulties. More wine, senores, he exclaimed in a loud voice, and stepping between their chairs in utter disregard of proper breeding. Drink, my captain for your wound has made you weak. And you, Don Diego, after your wild ride... I doubt its wildness, Captain Ramon observed. Don Diego accepted the proffered wine mug and turned his back upon the captain. He glanced across at Senorita Lolita and smiled. He got up deliberately and picked up his chair and carried it across the room to set it down beside her. And did the rogue frighten you, Senorita? he asked suppose he did senor would you avenge the matter would you put blade at your side and ride abroad until you found him and then punish him as he deserves by the saints were it necessary i might do as much but i am able to employ a raft of strong fellows who would like nothing better than to run down the rogue why should i risk my own neck oh she exclaimed exasperated let us not talk further of this bloodthirsty senor zorro he begged there are other things fit for conversation have you been thinking senorita on the object of my visit earlier in the day senorita lolita thought of it now she remembered again what the marriage would mean to her parents and their fortunes and she recalled the highwayman too and remembered his dash and spirit and wished that don diego could be such a man and she could not say the word that would make her the betrothed of don diego vega I have scarcely had time to think of it, Caballero, she replied. I trust you will make up your mind soon, he said. You are so eager. My father was at me again this afternoon. He insists that I should take a wife as soon as possible. It is rather a nuisance, of course, but a man must please his father. Lolita bit her lips because of her quick anger. Was ever girl so courted before, she wondered. I shall make up my mind as soon as possible, senor she said finally does this captain ramon remain long at the hacienda a little hope came into lolita's breast could it be possible that don diego vega was jealous if that were true possibly there might be stuff in the man after all perhaps he would awaken and love and passion come to him and he would be as other young men my father has asked him to remain until he is able to travel to the presidio she replied he is able to travel now a mere scratch you will not return to-night she asked it probably will make me ill but i must return there are certain things that must engage my interest early in the morning business is such a nuisance perhaps my father will offer to send you in the carriage huh, it were kindness if he does a man may doze a bit in a carriage but if this highwayman should stop you I need not fear, senorita. Have I not wealth? Could I not purchase my release? You would pay ransom rather than fight him, senor. I have lots of money, but only one life, senorita. Would I be a wise man to risk having my blood let out? It would be the manly part, would it not? She asked. Any male can be manly at times, but it takes a clever man to be sagacious. He said. 
Don Diego laughed lightly, as if it cost him an effort, and bent forward to speak in lower tones. On the other side of the room, Don Carlos was doing his best to make Captain Ramon comfortable, and was glad that he and Don Diego remained apart for the time being. Don Carlos, the captain said, I come from a good family, and the governor is friendly toward me, as no doubt you have heard. I am but twenty-three years of age, else I would hold a higher office, but my future is assured. I am rejoiced to learn it, senor. I never set eyes upon your daughter until this evening, but she has captivated me, senor. Never have I seen such grace and beauty, such flashing eyes. I ask your permission, senor, to pay my addresses to the senorita. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of The Curse of Capistrano by Johnston McCulley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Eleven Three Suitors. Here was a fix. Don Carlos had no wish to anger Don Diego Vega or a man who stood high in the governor's regard and how was he to evade it if lolita could not force her heart to accept don diego perhaps she could learn to love captain ramon after don diego he was the best potential son-in-law in the vicinity your answer senor the captain was asking i trust you will not misunderstand me senor don carlos said in lower tones i must make a simple explanation proceed senor but this morning don diego vega asked me the same question ha ah. you know his blood in his family senor could i refuse him of rights i could not but i may tell you this the senorita weds no man unless it is her wish so don diego has my permission to pay his addresses but if he fails to touch her heart then i may try the captain asked you have my permission senor of course don diego has great wealth but you have a dashing way with you and don diego that is he is rather i understand perfectly senor the captain said laughing he is not exactly a brave and dashing caballero unless your daughter prefers wealth to a genuine man my daughter will follow the dictates of her heart senor don carlos said proudly then the affair is between don diego vega and myself so long as you use discretion senor i would have nothing happen that would cause enmity between the vega family and mine your interests shall be protected don carlos captain ramon declared as don diego talked the senorita lolita observed her father and captain ramon and guessed what was being said it pleased her of course that a dashing officer should enter the lists for her hand and yet she had felt no thrill when first she looked into his eyes senor zorro now had thrilled her to the tips of her tiny toes and merely because he had talked to her and touched the palm of her hand with his lips if don diego vega were only more like the highwayman if some man appeared who combined vega's wealth with the rogue's spirit and dash and courage there was a sudden tumult outside and into the room strode the soldiers sergeant gonzales at their head they saluted their captain and the big sergeant looked with wonder at his wounded shoulder the rogue escaped us gonzales reported we followed him for a distance of three miles or so as he made his way into the hills where we came upon him well ramon questioned and his allies what is this fully ten men were waiting for him there my captain they set upon us before we were aware of their presence we fought them well and three of them we wounded but they made their escape and took their comrades with them we had not been expecting a band of course and so rode into their ambush 
Then we have to contend with a band of them. Captain Ramon said. Sergeant, you will select a score of men in the morning and have command over them. You will take the trail of this Senor Zorro, and you will not stop until he is either captured or slain. I will add a quarter's wages to the reward of His Excellency, the Governor, if you are successful. Ah, it is what I have wished, Sergeant Gonzalez cried. Now we shall run this coyote to earth in short order. I shall show you the color of his blood. Should be no more than right, since he has seen the color of the captain's don diego put in what is this don diego my friend captain you have crossed blades with the road i have the captain assented you but followed a tricky horse my sergeant the fellow was here in a closet and came out after i had entered so it must have been some other man you met with his companions up in the hills the senor zorro treated me much as he treated you in the tavern had a pistol handy in case I should prove too expert with the blade. Captain and sergeant looked at each other squarely, each wondering how much the other had been lying, while Don Diego chuckled faintly and tried to press the Senorita Lolita's hand and failed. This thing can be settled only in blood, Gonzales declared. I shall pursue the rascal until he is run to earth i have permission to select my men you may take any at the presidio the captain said sergeant gonzalez i should like to go with you don diego said suddenly by the saints it would kill you caballero day and night in the saddle uphill and downhill through dust and heat and with a chance at fighting well perhaps it were best for me to remain in the pueblo don diego admitted but he has annoyed this family of which i am a true friend at least you will keep me informed you will tell me how he escapes if he dodges you i at least may know that you are on his trail and where you are riding so i may be with you in spirit uh, certainly caballero certainly sergeant gonzalez replied i shall give you the chance of looking upon the rogue's dead face i swear it tis a terrible oath my sergeant suppose it should come to pass i mean if i slay the rascal caballero my captain do you return this night to the presidio yes ramon replied despite my wound i can ride a horse he glanced toward don diego as he spoke and there was almost a sneer upon his lips what magnificent grit don diego said i too shall return to reina de los angeles if don carlos would be as good as to have his carriage around i can tie my horse to the rear of it to ride horseback the distance again this day would be the death of me gonzalez laughed and led the way from the house captain ramon paid his respects to the ladies glowered at don diego and followed the caballero faced senorita lolita again as her parents escorted the captain to the door you will think of the matter he asked my father will be at me again within a few days and i shall escape censure if i am able to tell him that it is all settled if you decide to wed me have your father send me word by a servant then i shall put my house in order against the wedding day i shall think of it the girl said we could be married at the mission of san gabriel only we should have to make the confounded journey there fray felipe of the mission has been my friend from the days of my boyhood and i would have him say the words unless you prefer otherwise he could come to reino de los angeles and read the ceremony in the little church on the plaza there i shall think of it the girl said again perhaps i may come out again to see within a few days if i survive this night buenos noches senorita i suppose i should uh, kiss your hand you need not take the trouble senorita lolita replied it might fatigue you ah thank you you are thoughtful i see i am fortunate if i get me a thoughtful wife don diego sauntered to the door senorita lolita rushed into her own room and beat at her breasts with her hands and tore at her hair a bit too angry too enraged to weep kiss her hand indeed senor zorro had not suggested it he had done it 
Senor Zorro had dared death to visit her. Senor Zorro had laughed as he fought, and then had escaped by a trick. Ah, if Don Diego Vega were half the man this highwayman appeared! She heard the soldiers gallop away, and after a little time she heard Don Diego Vega depart in her father's carriage, and then she went out into the great room again to her parents my father it is impossible that i wed with don diego vega she said what has caused your decision my daughter i scarcely can tell except that he is not the sort of man i wish for my husband his lifeless existence with him would be a continual torment captain ramon also has asked permission to pay you his addresses doña catalina said and he is almost as bad i do not like the look in his eyes the girl replied you are too particular don carlos told her if the persecution continues another year we shall be beggars here is the best catch in the country seeking you and you would refuse him and you do not like a high army officer because you do not fancy the look in his eyes think on it girl an alliance with don diego vega is much to be desired perhaps when you know him better you will like him more and the man may awaken I thought I saw a flash of it this night. Deemed him jealous because of the presence of the captain here. If you can arouse his jealousy... Senorita Lolita burst into tears, but soon the tempest of weeping passed, and she dried her eyes. I... I shall do my best to like him, she said. But I cannot bring myself to say yet that I will be his wife she hurried into her room again and called for the native woman who attended her soon the house was in darkness and the grounds about it save for the fires down by the adobe huts where the natives told one another grim tales of the night's events each trying to make his falsehood the greatest a gentle snore came from the apartment of don carlos pulido and his wife but the senorita lolita did not slumber she had her head propped on one hand and she was looking through a window at the fires in the distance and her mind was full of thoughts of senor zorro she remembered the grace of his bow the music of his deep voice the touch of his lips upon her palm i would he were not a rogue she sighed <sighs> how a woman could love such a man End of chapter 11「Shortly after daybreak the following morning there was considerable tumult in the plaza at Reina de los Angeles. Sergeant Pedro Gonzalez was there with a score of troopers, almost all that were stationed at the local presidio, and they were preparing for the chase of Senor Zorro. The big sergeant's voice roared out above the din as men adjusted saddles and looked to bridles and inspected their water bottles and small supplies of provisions for sergeant gonzalez had ordered that his force travel light and live off the country as much as possible he had taken the commands of his captain seriously he was going after senor zorro and did not propose to return until he had him or had died in an effort to effect a capture i shall nail the fellow's pelt to the presidio door my friend he told the fat landlord then i shall collect the governor's reward and pay the score i owe you i pray the saints it may be true the landlord said what fool that i pay you do you fear to lose a few small coins i meant that i pray you may be successful in capturing the man the landlord said telling the falsehood glibly captain ramon was not up to see the start having a small fever because of his wound but the people of the pueblo crowded around sergeant gonzalez and his men asking a multitude of questions and the sergeant found himself the centre of interest 
the curse of capistrano soon shall cease to exist he boasted loudly pedro gonzalez is on his trail ha ah, when i stand face to face with the fellow the front door of don diego vega's house opened at that juncture and don diego himself appeared at which the townsmen wondered a bit since it was so early in the morning sergeant gonzalez dropped a bundle he was handling put his hands upon his hips and looked at his friend with sudden interest you have not been to bed he charged but i have don diego declared and are you up again so soon here is some devilish mystery that needs an explanation you made noise enough to awaken the dead don diego said it could not be helped caballero since we are acting under orders were it not possible to make your preparations at the presidio instead of here in the plaza or did you think not enough persons would see your importance there now by the do not say it don diego commanded as a matter of fact i am up early because i must make a confounded trip to my hacienda a journey of some ten miles to inspect the flocks and herds never become a wealthy man sergeant gonzalez for wealth asks too much of a man <laughs> something tells me that i shall never suffer on that account <laughs> said the sergeant laughing you go with escort my friend a couple of natives that is all if you should meet up with the senor zorro he probably would hold you for a pretty ransom is he supposed to be between this place and my hacienda don diego asked a native arrived a short time ago with word that he had been seen on the road running to pala and san luis rey we ride in that direction and since your hacienda is the other way no doubt you will not meet the rascal now i feel somewhat relieved to hear you say it so you ride toward pala my sergeant we do we shall try to pick up his trail as soon as possible and once we have it we shall run this fox down meanwhile we also shall attempt to find his den we start at once i shall await news eagerly don diego said good fortune go with you gonzalez and his men mounted and the sergeant shouted an order and they galloped across the plaza raising great clouds of dust and took the highway toward pala and san luis rey don diego looked after them until nothing could be seen but a tiny dust cloud in the distance then called for his own horse he too mounted and rode away toward san gabriel and two native servants rode mules and followed a short distance behind but before he departed don diego wrote a message and sent it by native courier to the pulido hacienda it was addressed to don carlos and read the soldiers are starting this morning to pursue the senor zorro and it has been reported that the highwayman has a band of rogues under his command and may offer battle there is no telling my friend what may happen i dislike having one in whom i am interested subjected to danger meaning your daughter particularly but also the doña catalina and yourself moreover this bandit saw your daughter last evening and certainly must have appreciated her beauty and he may seek to see her again i beg of you to come at once to my house in the reina de los angeles and make it as your home until matters are settled i am leaving this morning to my hacienda but have left orders with my servants that you are to give what commands you will i shall hope to see you when i return which will be in two or three days diego don carlos read that epistle aloud to his wife and daughter and then looked up to see how they took it he scoffed at the danger himself being an old war-horse but did not wish to put his women-folk in jeopardy what think you he asked it has been some time since we have visited the pueblo doña catalina said i have some friends left among the ladies there i think it will be an excellent thing to do it certainly will not injure our fortunes to have it become known we are house-guests of don diego vega don carlos said what does our daughter think 
it was a concession to ask her and lolita realized that she was granted this unusual favor because of don diego's wooing she hesitated some time before answering i believe it will be all right she said i should like to visit the pueblo for we see scarcely anybody here at the hacienda but people may talk concerning don diego and myself nonsense don carlos exploded could there be anything more natural than that we should visit the vegas since our blood is almost as good as theirs and better than that of others but it is don diego's house and not that of his father still he will not be there for two or three days he says and we can return when he comes then it is settled don carlos declared i shall see my superintendent and give him instructions he hurried into the patio and rang the big bell for the superintendent being well pleased for when the senorita lolita saw the rich furnishings in the house of don diego vega she might the more readily accept don diego as a husband he thought when she saw the silks and satins the elegant tapestries the furniture inlaid with gold and studded with precious stones when she realized that she could be mistress of this and much more besides don carlos flattered himself that he knew the feminine heart soon after the siesta hour a careta was brought before the door drawn by mules and driven by a native dona catalina and lolita got into it and don carlos bestrode his best horse and rode at its side and so they went down the trail to the highway and down the highway toward reina de los angeles they passed folk who marvelled to see the pulido family thus going abroad for it was well known that they had met with ill fortune and scarcely went anywhere now it was even whispered that the ladies did not keep up with the fashions and that the servants were poorly fed but remained at the hacienda because their master was so kind but dona catalina and her daughter held their heads proudly as did don carlos and they greeted the people they knew and so continued along the highway presently they made a turning and could see the pueblo in the distance the plaza and the church with its high cross on one side of it and the inn and storehouses and a few residences of the more pretentious sort like don diego's and the scattered huts of natives and poor folk the careta stopped before don diego's door and servants rushed out to make the guests welcome spreading a carpet from the careta to the doorway that the ladies would not have to step in the dust don carlos led the way into the house after ordering that the horse and mules be cared for and the careta put away and there they rested for a time and the servants brought out wine and food they went through the rich house then and even the eyes of dona catalina who had seen many rich houses widened at what she saw here in don diego's home to think that our daughter can be mistress of all this when she speaks the word she gasped senorita lolita said nothing but she began thinking that perhaps it would not be so bad after all to become the wife of don diego she was fighting a mental battle was senorita lolita on the one side was wealth and position and the safety and good fortune of her parents and a lifeless man for husband and on the other side was the romance and ideal love she craved until the last hope was gone she could not give the latter up don carlos left the house and crossed the plaza to the inn where he met several gentlemen of age and renewed acquaintance with them albeit he noticed that none was enthusiastic in his greeting they feared he supposed to appear openly friendly to him since he was in the bad graces of the governor you are in the pueblo on business one asked not so senor don carlos replied and gladly since here was a chance to set himself right in part this senor zorro is abroad and the soldiers are after him we are aware of that 
there may be a battle, or a series of raids, since it is whispered that now Signor Zorro has a band of cutthroats with him, and my hacienda is off by itself, and would be at the mercy of the thief. Ah, and so you bring your family to the Pueblo until the matter is at an end. I had not thought of doing so. But this morning, Don Diego Vega sent out to me a request that I bring my family here and make use of his house for the time being. Don Diego has gone to his hacienda, but will return within a short time. The eyes of those who heard opened a bit at that, but Don Carlos pretended not to notice and went on sipping his wine. Don Diego was out to visit me yesterday morning. He continued. We renewed old times, and my hacienda had a visit from this Senor Zorro last night, as doubtless you have heard, and Don Diego, learning of it, galloped out again, fearing we had met with disaster. Twice in one day, gasped one of those who heard. I have said it, Senor. You, uh, that is your daughter, is very beautiful, is she not, Don Carlos Polito? And seventeen, is she not? About... Eighteen, senor. She is called beautiful, I believe. Don Carlos admitted. Those around him glanced at one another. They had the solution now. Don Diego Vega was seeking to wed Senorita Lolita Pulido. That meant that Pulido's fortunes would soon be at the flood again, and that he might feel called upon to remember his friends and look askance at those who had not stood by him. So now they crowded forward, alert to do him honor, and asked concerning crops and the increase of his herds and flocks, and whether the bees were doing as well as usual, and did he think the olives were excellent this year. Don Carlos appeared to take it all as a matter of course. He accepted the wine they bought, and purchased himself, and the fat landlord darted about doing their bidding and trying to compute the day's profits in his head, which was a hopeless task for him. When Don Carlos left the inn at dusk, several of them followed him to the door, and two of the more influential walked with him across the plaza to the door of Don Diego's house. One of these begged that Don Carlos and his wife visit his house that evening for music and talk, and Don Carlos graciously accepted the invitation. Doña Catalina had been watching from a window, and her face was beaming when she met her husband at the door. "'Everything goes well,' he said. "'They have met me with open arms, and I have accepted an invitation to visit tonight. "'But Lolita?' Doña Catalina protested. She must remain here, of course. Will it not be all right? There are half a hundred servants about. And I have accepted the invitation, my dear. Such a chance to win favor again could not be disregarded, of course, and so Lolita was made acquainted with the arrangement. She was to remain in the great living room, reading a volume of verse she had found there, and if she grew sleepy, she was to retire to a certain chamber. The servants would guard her, and the despensero would look after her wishes personally. Don Carlos and his wife went to make their evening visit, being lighted across the plaza by half a dozen natives who held torches in their hands, for the night was without a moon, and rain was threatening again. Senorita Lolita curled up on a couch, the volume of verse in her lap, and began to read. Each verse treated of love, romance, passion. She marveled that Don Diego would read such, being so lifeless himself, but the volume showed that it had been much handled. She sprang from the couch to look at other books on a bench not far away, and her amazement increased. Volume after volume of poets who sang of love, volumes that had to do with horsemanship, books that had been written at the dictation of masters of fence, tales of great generals and warriors were there. Surely these volumes were not for a man of Don Diego's blood, she told herself, and then she thought that perhaps he reveled in them, though not in the manner of life they preached. 
don diego was something of a puzzle she told herself for the hundredth time and she went back and began reading the poetry again then captain ramon hammered at the front door end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of *The Curse of Capistrano* by Johnston McCulley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirteen: Love Comes Swiftly. The despensero hurried to open it. I regret that Don Diego is not at home, Senor. He said. He has gone to his hacienda. I know as much. Don Carlos and wife and daughter are here, are they not? Don Carlos and his wife are out on a visit this evening, senor. The senorita? Is here, of course. In that case, I shall pay my respects to the senorita. Captain Ramon said. Senor, pardon me, but the lady is alone. Am I not a proper man? The captain demanded. It it is scarcely right for her to receive the visit of a gentleman when her duenna is not present who are you to speak to me of such proprieties captain ramon demanded out of my way scum cross me and you shall be punished i know things concerning you the face of the despensero went white at that for the captain spoke the truth and at a word could cause him considerable trouble and mayhap a term in carcel yet he knew what was right but senor he protested captain ramon thrust him aside with his left arm and stalked into the big living-room lolita sprang up in alarm when she saw him standing before her ah senorita i trust that i did not startle you he said I regret that your parents are absent, yet I must have a few words with you. This servant would deny me entrance, but I imagine you have naught to fear from a man with one wounded arm. It, it is scarcely proper, is it, senor? The girl asked, a bit frightened. I feel no harm can come of it, he said. He went across the room and sat down on one end of the couch and admired her beauty frankly, the despensero hovered near go to your kitchen fellow captain ramon commanded no allow him to remain lolita begged my father commanded it and he courts trouble if he leaves and if he remains go fellow the servant went captain ramon turned toward the girl again and smiled upon her he flattered himself that he knew women they loved to see a man show mastery over other men more beautiful than ever senorita he said in a purring voice i really am glad to find you thus alone for there is something i would say to you what can that be senor last night at your father's hacienda i asked his permission to pay my addresses to you your beauty has inflamed my heart senorita and i would have you for my wife your father consented except that he said don diego vega also received permission so it appears that it lies between don diego and myself should you speak of it senor she asked certainly don diego vega is not the man for you he went on he has courage spirit is he not a laughing-stock because of his weakness you speak ill of him in his own house the senorita asked her eyes flashing i speak the truth senorita i would have your favor can you not look upon me with kindness can you not give me hope that i may win your heart and hand captain ramon all this is unworthy she said it is not the proper manner and you know it i beg you to leave me now i wait your answer senorita her outraged pride rose up at that why could she not be wooed as other senoritas in the proper fashion why was this man so bold in his words why did he disregard the conventions you must leave me she said firmly this is all wrong and you are aware of it 
would you make my name a byword captain ramon suppose somebody was to come and find us like this alone nobody will come senorita can you not give me an answer no she cried starting to get to her feet it is not right that you should ask it my father i assure you shall hear of this visit your father he sneered a man who has the ill will of the governor a man who is being plucked because he possessed no political sense i fear not your father he should be proud of the fact that captain ramon looks at his daughter Signor, do not run away he said clutching her hand i have done you the honor to ask you to be my wife done me the honor she cried angrily and almost in tears it is the man who has done the honor when a woman accepts him i like when you rage he observed sit down again beside me here and now give me your answer Signor, you will wed me of course i shall intercede with the governor for your father and get a part of his estate restored i shall take you to san francisco de assis to the governor's house where you will be admired by persons of rank Signor, let me go my answer senorita you have held me off enough she wrenched away from him confronted him with blazing eyes her tiny hands clenched at her sides wed with you she cried rather would i remain a maid all my life rather would i wed with a native rather would i die than wed with you i wed a caballero a gentleman or no man and i cannot say that you are such pretty words from the daughter of a man who is about ruined ruin would not change the blood of the pulido senor i doubt whether you understand that evidently having ill blood yourself don diego shall hear of this he is my father's friend and you would wed the rich don diego eh and straighten out your father's affairs you would not wed an honourable soldier but would sell yourself Signor, she shrieked this was beyond endurance she was alone there was nobody near to resent the insult so her blood called upon her to avenge it herself like a flash of lightning her hand went forward and came against captain ramon's cheek with a crack then she sprang backward but he grasped her by an arm and drew her toward him i shall take a kiss to pay for that he said such a tiny bit of womanhood can be handled with one arm thank the saints she fought him striking and scratching at his breast for she could not reach his face but he only laughed at her and held her tighter until she was almost spent and breathless and finally he threw back her head and looked down into her eyes a kiss in payment senorita he said it will be a pleasure to tame such a wild one she tried to fight again but could not she called upon the saints to aid her and captain ramon laughed more and bent his head and his lips came close to hers but he never claimed the kiss she started to wrench away from him again and he was forced to strengthen his arm and pull her forward and from a corner of the room there came a voice that was at once deep and stern one moment senor it said captain ramon released the girl and whirled on one heel he blinked his eyes to pierce the gloom of the corner he heard senorita lolita give a glad cry then captain ramon disregarding the presence of the lady cursed once and loudly for senor zorro stood before him he did not pretend to know how the highwayman had entered the house he did not stop to think of it he realized that he was without a blade at his side and that he could not use it had he one because of his wounded shoulder and senor zorro was walking toward him from the corner outlaw i may be but i respect women the curse of capistrano said and you an officer of the army do not it appears what are you doing here captain ramon and what do you hear i heard a lady scream which is warrant enough for caballero to enter any place senor it appears to me that you have broken all the conventions 
Perhaps the lady has broken them also. Senor, roared the highwayman. Another thought like that, and I cut you down where you stand, though you are a wounded man. How shall I punish you? Despensero. Natives. The captain shouted suddenly. Here is Senor Zorro, a reward if you take him. The masked man laughed. Twill do you small good to call for help, he said. Spend your breath in saying your prayers, rather. You do well to threaten a wounded man. You deserve death, senor, but I suppose I must allow you to escape that. But you will go down upon your knees and apologize to the senorita, and then you will go from this house, slink from it like the cur you are, and keep your mouth closed regarding what has transpired here. If you do not, I promise to soil my blade with your life's blood. Ha! <sighs> On your knees, senor, and instantly. Senor Zorro commanded. I have no time to waste in waiting. I am an officer. On your knees. Commanded senor Zorro again in a terrible voice. He sprang forward and grasped Captain Ramon by his well shoulder and threw him to the floor. Quickly, poltroon, tell the senorita that you humbly beg her pardon, which she will not grant, of course, since you are beneath speaking to, and that you will not annoy her again. Say it, or by the saints, you have made your last speech. Captain Ramon said it, and then Senor Zorro grasped him by the neck and lifted him, and propelled him to the door, and hurled him into the darkness and had his boots not been soft, Captain Ramon would have been injured more deeply, both in feelings and anatomy. Senor Zorro closed the door as the despensero came running into the room to stare in fright at the masked man. Senorita, I trust that I have been of service, the highwayman said. That scoundrel will not bother you further, else he feels the sting of my blade again. Oh! Thank you, senor, thank you, she cried. I shall tell my father this good deed you have done. Dispensero, get him wine. There was naught for the butler to do except obey, since she had voiced the order, and he hurried from the room, pondering on the times and the manners. Senorita Lolita stepped to the man's side. Senor, she breathed. You saved me from insult. You saved me from the pollution of that man's lips. Signor, though you deem me unmaidenly, I offer you freely the kiss he would have taken. She put up her face and closed her eyes. And I shall not look when you raise your mask, she said. It were too much, Signorita, he said. Your hand, but not your lips. You shame me, Signor. I was bold to offer it, and you have refused. You shall feel no shame, he said. He bent swiftly, raised the bottom of his mask, and touched lightly her lips with his. Ah, senorita, he said, I would I were an honest man, and could claim you openly. My heart is filled with love of you. And mine with love of you. This is madness. None must know. I would not fear to tell the world, senor. Your father in his fortunes. Don Diego. I love you, senor. Your chance to be a great lady. Do you think I did not know Don Diego was the man you meant when we spoke in your father's patio? This is a whim, senorita. It is love, senor, whether anything comes of it or not. And a bolero does not love twice. What possibly could come of it but distress? We shall see. God is good. It is madness. Sweet madness, senor. He clasped her to him and bent his head again, and again she closed her eyes and took his kiss, only this time the kiss was longer. She made no effort to see his face. I may be ugly, he said, but I love you. Disfigured, senorita. Still I love you. What hope can we have? Go, senor, before my parents return. I shall say nothing except that you saved me from insult and then went your way again. 
they will think that you came to rob Don Diego. And turn honest, senor, for my sake. Turn honest, I say, and claim me. No man knows your face, and if you take off your mask forever, none ever will know your guilt. It is not as if you were an ordinary thief. I know why you have stolen, to avenge the helpless, to punish cruel politicians, to aid the oppressed. I know that you have given what you have stolen to the poor. Oh, senor! But my task is not yet done, senorita, and I feel called upon to finish it. Then finish it, and may the saints guard you as I feel sure they will. And when it is finished, come back to me. I shall know you in whatever garb you come. Nor shall I wait that long, senorita. I shall see you often. I could not exist else. Guard yourself. I shall in truth now, since I have double reason. Life never was so sweet as now. He backed away from her slowly. He turned and glanced toward a window near at hand. I must go, he said. I cannot wait for the wine. That was but a subterfuge so that we could be alone, she confessed. Until the next time, senorita, and may it not be long. On guard, senor. Always, loved one. Senorita, adios. Again their eyes met, and then he waved his hand at her, gathered his cloak close about his body, darted to the window, and went through it. The darkness outside swallowed him. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of The Curse of Capistrano by Johnston Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Fourteen Captain Ramon Writes a Letter. Picking himself up out of the dust before Don Diego Vega's door, Captain Ramon darted through the darkness to the footpath that ran up the slope toward the Presidio. His blood was aflame with rage, his face was purple with wrath. There remained at the Presidio no more than half a dozen soldiers, for the greater part of the garrison had gone with Sergeant Gonzales, and of these half-dozen four were on the sick list and two were necessary as guards so captain ramon could not send men down to the vega house in an effort to effect a capture of the highwaymen moreover he decided that senor zorro would not remain there more than a few minutes but would mount his horse and ride away for the highwaymen had a name for not resting long in one place besides captain ramon had no wish to let it become known that this senor zorro had met him a second time and had treated him much like a peon could he give out the information that he had insulted a senorita and that senor zorro had punished him because of it that senor zorro had caused him to get down upon his knees and apologize and then had kicked him through the front door like a dog the captain decided it were better to say nothing of the occurrence he supposed that senorita lolita would tell her parents and that the despensero would give testimony but he doubted whether don carlos would do anything about it don carlos would think twice before affronting an officer of the army being the recipient already of the governor's frowns ramon only hoped that don diego would not learn much of the happening for if a vega raised hand against him the captain would have difficulty maintaining his position pacing the floor of his office captain ramon allowed his wrath to grow and thought on these things and many others he had kept abreast of the times and he knew that the governor and the men about him were sorely in need of more funds to waste in riotous living they had plucked those men of wealth against whom there was the faintest breath of suspicion and they would welcome a new victim might not the captain suggest one and at the same time strengthen his own position with the governor would the captain dare hint that perhaps the vega family was wavering in its loyalty to the governor at least he could do one thing he decided he could have his revenge for the flouting the daughter of don carlos pulido had given him 
captain ramon grinned despite his wrath as the thought came to him he called for writing materials and informed one of his well men that he should prepare for a journey being about to be named for a courier's job ramon paced the floor for some minutes more thinking on the matter and trying to decide just how to word the epistle he intended writing and finally he sat down before the long table and addressed his message to his excellency the governor at his mansion in san francisco de assis this is what he wrote your intelligence is regarding this highwayman senor zorro as he is known have come to hand i regret that i am unable at this writing to report the rogue's capture but i trust that you will be lenient with me in the matter since circumstances are somewhat unusual i have the greater part of my force in pursuit of the fellow with orders to get him in person or to fetch me his corpse but this senor zorro does not fight alone he is being given succor at certain places in the neighborhood allowed to remain in hiding when necessary given food and drink and no doubt fresh horses Within the past day he visited the hacienda of Don Carlos Pulido, a caballero known to be hostile to your excellency. I sent men there and went myself. While my soldiers took up his trail, the man came from a closet in the living room at Don Carlos's house and attacked me treacherously. He wounded me in the right shoulder, but I fought him off until he became frightened and dashed away, making his escape. I may mention that I was hindered somewhat by this Don Carlos in pursuing the man. Also, when I arrived at the hacienda, indications were that the man had been eating his evening meal there. The Pulido Hacienda is an excellent place for such a man to hide, being somewhat off the main highway. I fear that Senor Zorro makes it his headquarters when he is in this vicinity, and I await your instructions in the matter. I may add that Don Carlos scarcely treated me with respect while i was in his presence and that his daughter the senorita lolita scarcely could keep from showing her admiration of this highwayman and from sneering at the efforts of the soldiery to capture him there are also indications of a famous and wealthy family of this neighborhood wavering in loyalty to your excellency but you will appreciate the fact that i cannot write of such a thing in a missive sent to you by courier with deep respect Ramon, Comandante and Captain, Presidio Reina de los Angeles. Ramon grinned again as he finished the letter. That last paragraph, he knew, would get the governor guessing. The Vega family was about the only famous and wealthy one that would fit the description. As for the Pulidos, Captain Ramon imagined what would happen to them the governor would not hesitate to deal out punishment and perhaps the senorita lolita would find herself without protection and in no position to reject the advances of a captain of the army now ramon addressed himself to the task of making a second copy of the letter intending to send one by his courier and preserve the other for his files in case something came up and he wished to refer to it having finished the copy he folded the original and sealed it carried it to the soldier's lounging-room and gave it to the man he had selected as courier the soldier saluted hurried out to his horse and rode furiously toward the north toward san fernando and santa barbara and on to san francisco de assis with the orders ringing in his ears that he should make all haste and get a change of horses at every mission and pueblo in the name of his excellency ramon returned to his office and poured out a measure of wine and began reading over the copy of the letter he half wished that he had made it stronger yet he knew that it were better to make it mild for then the governor would not think he was exaggerating he stopped reading now and then to curse the name of senor zorro and frequently he reflected on the beauty and grace of the senorita lolita and told himself she should be punished for the manner in which she had treated him he supposed that senor zorro was miles away by this time and putting more miles between himself and reina de los angeles but he was mistaken in that 
for the curse of capistrano as the soldiers called him had not hurried away after leaving the house of don diego vega End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the curse of capistrano by johnston macaulay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter fifteen at the presidio senor zorro had gone a short distance through the darkness to where he had left his horse in the rear of a native's hut and there he had stood thinking of the love that had come to him presently he chuckled as if well pleased then mounted and rode slowly toward the path that led to the presidio he heard a horseman galloping away from the place and thought captain ramon had sent a man to call back sergeant gonzales and the troopers and put them on the fresher trail senor zorro knew how affairs stood at the presidio knew to a man how many of the soldiery were there and that four were ill with a fever and that there was but one well man now besides the captain since one had ridden away he laughed again and made his horse climb the slope slowly so as to make little noise in the rear of the presidio building he dismounted and allowed the reins to drag on the ground knowing that the animal would not move from the spot now he crept through the darkness to the wall of the building and made his way around it carefully until he came to a window he raised himself on a pile of adobe bricks and peered inside it was captain ramon's office into which he looked he saw the commandante sitting before a table reading a letter which it appeared he had just finished writing captain ramon was talking to himself as does many an evil man that will cause consternation for the pretty senorita he was saying that will teach her not to flaunt an officer of his excellency's forces when her father is in the carcel charged with high treason and his estates have been taken away then perhaps she will listen to what i have to say senor zorro had no difficulty in distinguishing the words he guessed instantly that captain ramon had planned a revenge that he contemplated mischief toward the pulidos beneath his mask the face of senor zorro grew black with rage he got down from the pile of adobe bricks and slipped on along the wall until he came to the corner of the building in a socket at the side of the front door a torch was burning and the only able-bodied man left in the garrison was pacing back and forth before the doorway a pistol in his belt and a blade at his side senor zorro noted the length of the man's pacing he judged the distance accurately and just as the man turned his back to resume his march the highwayman sprang his hands closed around the soldier's throat as his knees struck the man in the back instantly they were upon the ground the surprised trooper now doing his best to put up a fight but senor zorro knowing that a bit of noise might mean disaster for him silenced the man by striking him on the temple with the heavy butt of his pistol he pulled the unconscious soldier back into the shadows gagged him with a strip torn from the end of his serape and bound his hands and feet with other strips then he drew his cloak about him looked to his pistol listened a moment to be sure the short fight with the soldier had not attracted the attention of any inside the building and slipped once more toward the door he was inside in an instant before him was the big lounging room with its hard dirt floor here were some long tables and bunks and wine mugs and harness and saddles and bridles senor zorro gave it but a glance to assure himself that no man was there and walked swiftly and almost silently across to the door that opened into the office of the commandante he made sure that his pistol was ready for instant use and then threw the door open boldly captain ramon was seated with his back toward it and now he whirled around in his chair with a snarl on his lips 
thinking one of his men had entered without the preliminary of knocking and ready to rebuke the man not a sound signor the highwayman warned you die if as much as a gasp escapes your lips he kept his eyes on those of the commandante closed the door behind him and advanced into the room he walked forward slowly without speaking the pistol held ready in front of him captain ramon had his hands on the table before him and his face had gone white this visit is necessary signor i believe signor zorro said i have not made it because i admire the beauty of your face what do you hear the captain asked disregarding the order to make no sound yet speaking in a tone scarcely above a whisper i happened to look in at the window signor i saw an epistle before you on the table and i heard you speak it is a bad thing for a man to talk to himself had you remained silent i might have gone on about my business as it is well signor the captain asked with a bit of his old arrogance returning to him i have a mind to read that letter before you does my military business interest you that much as to that we shall say nothing signor kindly remove your hands from the table but do not reach toward the pistol at your side unless you wish to die the death instantly it would not grieve me to have to send your soul into the hereafter the commandante did as he had been directed and senor zorro went forward cautiously and snatched up the letter then he retreated a few paces again still watching the man before him i am going to read this he said but i warn you that i shall watch you closely also do not make a move senor unless it is your wish to visit your ancestors he read swiftly and when he had finished he looked the commandante straight in the eyes for some time without speaking and his own eyes were glittering malevolently through his mask captain ramon began to feel more uncomfortable senor zorro stepped across to the table still watching the other and held the letter to the flame of a candle it caught fire blazed presently dropped to the floor a bit of ash senor zorro put one foot upon it the letter will not be delivered he said so you fight women do you senor a brave officer and an ornament to his excellency's forces i doubt not he would grant you promotion if he knew of this you insult his senorita because her father for the time being is not friendly with those in power and because she repulses you as you deserve you set about to cause trouble for the members of her family truly it is a worthy deed he took a step closer and bent forward still holding the pistol ready before him let me not hear of you sending any letter similar to the one i have just destroyed he said i regret at the present time that you are unable to stand before me and cross blades it would be an insult to my sword to run you through yet would i do it to rid the world of such a fellow you speak bold words to a wounded man no doubt the wound will heal senor and i shall keep myself informed regarding it and when it has healed and you have back your strength i shall take the trouble to hunt you up and call you to account for what you have attempted doing this night let that be understood between us again their eyes blazed each man's into those of the other and senor zorro stepped backward and drew his cloak closer about him to their ears there came suddenly a jangle of harness the tramp of horses feet the raucous voice of sergeant pedro gonzalez oh do not dismount the sergeant was crying to his men at the door i but make report and then we go after the rogue there shall be no rest until we take him senor zorro glanced quickly around the room for he knew escape by the entrance was cut off now captain ramon's eyes flashed with keen anticipation ho oh, gonzales he shrieked before zorro could warn him against it 
To the rescue, Gonzales. Senor Zorro is here. And then he looked at the highwayman defiantly, as if telling him to do his worst. But Senor Zorro had no desire to fire his pistol and let out the captain's lifeblood, it appeared, preferring to save him for the blade when his shoulder should have healed. Remain where you are, he commanded, and darted toward the nearest window. The big sergeant had heard, however. He called upon his men to follow, and rushed across the large room to the door of the office and threw it open. A bellow of rage escaped him as he saw the masked man standing beside the table, and saw the commandante sitting before it with his hands spread out before him. "'By the saints we have him!' Gonzales cried. "'Hid with you, troopers! Guard the doors! Some look to the windows!' Senor Zorro had transferred his pistol to his left hand and had whipped out his blade. Now he swept it forward and sidewise, and the candles were struck from the table. Zorro put his foot upon the only one that remained lighted and extinguished it in that manner, and the room was in darkness. "'Lights! Bring a torch!' Gonzales shrieked. Senor Zorro sprang aside against the wall and made his way around it rapidly while gonzales and two other men sprang into the room and one remained guarding the door while in the other room several ran to get a torch and managed to get in one another's way the man with the torch came rushing through the door finally and he shrieked and went down with a sword blade through his breast and the torch fell to the floor and was extinguished and then before the sergeant could reach the spot senor zorro was back in the darkness again and could not be found gonzales was roaring his curses now and searching for the man he wished to slay and the captain was crying to him to be careful and not put his blade through a trooper by mistake the other men were storming around in the other room one came with a second torch zorro's pistol spoke and the torch was shot from the man's hand the highwayman sprang forward and stamped upon it putting it out, and again retreated to the darkness, changing his position rapidly, listening for the deep breathing that would tell him the exact location of his various foes. "'Catch the rogue!' the commandante was shrieking. "'Can one man thus make fools of the lot of you?' Then he ceased to speak, for Senor Zorro had grasped him from behind and shut off his wind, and now the highwayman's voice rang out above the din. Soldiers, I have your captain. I am going to carry him before me and back out the door. I am going to cross the other room and so reach the outside of the building. I have discharged one pistol, but I am holding its mate at the base of the captain's brain. And when one of you attacks me, I fire, and you are without a captain." The captain could feel cold steel at the back of his head, and he shrieked for the men to use caution, and Senor Zorro carried him to the doorway and backed out, with the captain held in front of him, while Gonzales and the troopers followed as closely as they dared, watching every move, hoping for a chance to catch him unaware. He crossed the big lounging room of the Presidio, and so came to the outside door. He was somewhat afraid of the men outside, for he knew that some of them had run around the building to guard the windows. The torch was still burning just outside the door, and Senor Zorro put up his hand and tore it down and extinguished it. But still there would be grave danger the moment he stepped out. Gonzales and the troopers were before him, spread out fan-fashion across the room, bending forward, waiting for a chance to get in a blow. Gonzales held a pistol in his hand, though he made out to despise the weapon, and was watching for an opportunity to shoot without endangering the life of his captain. "'Back, senores,' the highwayman commanded now. "'I would have more room in which to make my start.' That is it. I thank you. Sergeant Gonzales, were not the odds so heavy, I might be tempted to play at fence with you and disarm you again. By the saints! Some other time, my sergeant. And now, senores, attention. 
it desolates me to say it but i had only the one pistol where the captain has been feeling all this time at the base of his brain is not except the bridal buckle i picked up from the floor is it not a pretty chest <laughs> senores adios suddenly he whirled the captain forward darted into the darkness and started toward his horse with the whole pack at his heels and pistol flashes splitting the blackness of the night and bullets whistling by his head his laughter came back to them on the stiffening breeze that blew in from the distant sea End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of The Curse of Capistrano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Sixteen The Chase That Failed. Senor Zorro charged his horse down the treacherous slope of the hill, where there was loose gravel, and a misstep would spell disaster, and where the troopers were slow to follow. Sergeant Gonzales possessed courage enough, and some of the men followed him, while others galloped off to right and left, planning to intercept the fugitive when he reached the bottom and turned. Senor Zorro, however, was before them, and took the trail toward San Gabriel at a furious gallop, while the troopers dashed along behind, calling to one another, and now and then discharging a pistol with a great waste of powder and ball, and no result so far as capturing or wounding the highwayman was concerned. Soon the moon came up. Senor Zorro had been anticipating that, and knew that it would make his escape more difficult— but his horse was fresh and strong while those ridden by the troopers had covered many miles during the day and so hope was not gone now he could be seen plainly by those who pursued and he could hear sergeant gonzales crying upon his men to urge their beasts to the utmost and effect a capture he glanced behind him as he rode, and observed that the troopers were scattering out in a long line, the stronger and fresher horses gaining on the others. So they rode for some five miles, the troopers holding the distance, but not making any gain, and Senor Zorro knew that soon their horses would weaken, and that the good steed he bestrode, which gave no signs of fatigue as yet, would outdistance them only one thing bothered him he wanted to be traveling in the opposite direction here the hills rose abruptly on either side of the highway and it was not possible for him to turn aside and make a great circle nor were there any trails he could follow and if he attempted to have his horse climb he would have to make slow progress and the troopers would come near enough to fire their pistols and mayhap wound him so he rode straight ahead gaining a bit now knowing that two miles farther up the valley there was a trail that swung off to the right and that by following it he would come to higher ground and so could double back on his tracks he had covered one of the two miles before he remembered that it had been noised abroad that a landslide had been caused by the recent torrential rain and had blocked this higher trail so he could not use that even when he reached it and now a bold thought came to his mind as he topped a slight rise in the terrain he glanced behind once more and saw that no two of the troopers were riding side by side they were well scattered and there was some distance between each two of them it would help his plan he dashed around a bend in the highway and pulled up his horse he turned the animal's head back toward whence he had come and bent forward in the saddle to listen when he could hear the hoof-beats of his nearest pursuer's horse he drew his blade took a turn of the reins around his left wrist and suddenly struck his beast in the flanks cruelly with his sharp rowels the animal he rode was not used to such treatment never having felt the spurs except when in a gallop and his master wished greater speed now he sprang forward like a thunderbolt dashed around the curve like a wild stallion and bore down upon the nearest of senor zorro's foes make way senor zorro cried 
the first man gave ground readily not sure that this was the highwayman coming back and when he was sure of it he shrieked the intelligence to those behind but they could not understand because of the clatter of hoofs on the hard road Senor Zorro bore down upon the second man, clashed swords with him, and rode on. He dashed around another curve, and his horse struck another fairly, and hurled him from the roadway. Zorro swung at the fourth man, and missed him, and was glad that the fellow's counterstroke missed him as well. And now there was naught but the straight ribbon of road before him, and his galloping foes dotting it. Like a maniac he rode them through, cutting and slashing at them as he passed. Sergeant Gonzales, far in the rear because of his jaded mount, realized what was taking place, and screeched at his men. And even as he screeched a thunderbolt seemed to strike his horse, unseating him and then senor zorro was through them and gone and they were following him again a cursing sergeant at their head but at a distance slightly greater than before he allowed his horse to go somewhat slower now since he could keep his distance and rode to the first cross trail into which he turned he took to higher ground and looked back to see the pursuit streaming out over the hill losing itself in the distance but still determined it was an excellent trick senor zorro said to his horse but we cannot try it often he passed the hacienda of a man friendly to the governor and a thought came to him gonzales might stop there and obtain fresh horses for himself and his men nor was he mistaken in that the troopers dashed up the driveway and dogs howled a welcome the master of the hacienda came to the door holding a candelero high above his head we chase senor zorro gonzales cried we require fresh steeds in the name of the governor the servants were called and gonzales and his men hurried to the corral magnificent horses were there horses almost as good as the one the highwayman rode and all were fresh the troopers quickly stripped saddles and bridles from their jaded mounts and put them on the fresh steeds and then dashed for the trail again and took up the pursuit Senor Zorro had gained quite a lead, but there was only one trail he could follow, and they might overtake him. Three miles away, on the crest of a small hill, there was an hacienda that had been presented to the mission of San Gabriel by a caballero who had died without leaving heirs. The governor had threatened to take it for the state, but so far had not done so, the Franciscans of San Gabriel having a name for protecting their property with determination. In charge of this hacienda was one Fray Felipe, a member of the order who was along in years, and under his direction the neophytes made the estate a profitable one, raising much livestock and sending to the storehouses great amounts of hides and tallow and honey and fruit, as well as wine. Gonzales knew the trail they were following led to this hacienda, and that just beyond it there was another trail that split, one part going to San Gabriel, and the other returning to Reina de los Angeles by a longer route. If Senor Zorro passed the hacienda, it stood to reason that he would take the trail that ran toward the pueblo, since, had he wished to go to San Gabriel, he would have continued along the highway in the first place, instead of turning and riding back through the troopers at some risk to himself. But he doubted whether Zorro would pass, for it was well known that the highwaymen dealt harshly with those who prosecuted the frailes, and it was to be believed that every Franciscan held a friendly feeling for him and would give him aid. The troopers came within sight of the hacienda and could see no light. Gonzales stopped them where the driveway started and listened in vain for the sounds of the man they pursued. He dismounted and inspected the dusty road, but could not tell whether a horseman had ridden toward the house recently. He issued quick orders, and the troops separated, half of the men remaining with their sergeant, and the others scattering in such manner that they could surround the house, search the huts of the natives, and look at the great barns. 
then sergeant gonzales rode straight up the driveway with half his men at his back forced his horse up the steps to the veranda as a sign that he held this place in little respect and knocked on the door with the hilt of his sword end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the curse of capistrano by johnston macaulay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter seventeen sergeant gonzales meets a friend presently light showed through the windows and after a time the door was thrown open fray felipe stood framed in it shading a candle with his hand a giant of a man now past sixty but one who had been a power in his time what is all this noise he demanded in his deep voice and why do you son of evil ride your horse on my veranda we are chasing this pretty senor zorro fry this man they call the curse of capistrano gonzales said and you expect to find him in this poor house stranger things have happened answer me fry have you heard a horseman gallop past within a short time i have not and has this senor zorro paid you a visit recently i do not know the man you mean you have heard of him doubtless i have heard he seeks to aid the oppressed that he has punished those who have committed sacrilege and that he has whipped those brutes who have beaten indians you are bold in your words fry it is my nature to speak the truth soldier you will be getting yourself into difficulties with the powers my roamed franciscan i fear no politician soldier i do not like the tone of your words fry i have half a mind to dismount and give you a taste of my whip senor fray felipe cried take ten years off my shoulders and i can drag you in the dirt that is a question for dispute however let us go to the subject of this visit you have not seen a masked fiend who goes by the name of senor zorro i have not soldier i shall have my men search your house you accuse me of falsehood fray felipe cried my men must do something to pass the time and they may as well search the house you have nothing you wish to hide recognizing the identity of my guests it might be well to hide the wine jugs fray felipe said sergeant gonzales allowed an oath to escape him and got down from his horse the others dismounted too and the sergeant's mount was taken off the veranda and left with the horse holder then gonzales drew off his gloves sheathed his sword and stamped through the door with the others at his heels as fray felipe fell back before him protesting against the intrusion from a couch in a far corner of the room there arose a man who stepped into the circle of light cast by the candelero as i have eyes it is my raucous friend he cried don diego you here gonzales gasped i have been at my hacienda looking over business affairs and i rode over to spend the night with fray felipe who has known me from babyhood these turbulent times i thought that here at least in this hacienda that is a bit out of the way and as a fry in charge of it i could for a time rest in peace without hearing of violence and bloodshed but it appears that i cannot is there no place in this country where a man may meditate and consult musicians and the poets the mill mush and goat's milk gonzales cried don diego you are my good friend and a true caballero tell me have you seen this senor zorro to-night i have not my sergeant you did not hear him ride past the hacienda i did not but a man could ride past and not be heard here in the house fray felipe and i have been talking together and we were just about to retire when you came then the rogue has ridden on and taken the trail toward the pueblo the sergeant declared you had him in view don diego asked ha ah, we were upon his hills caballero but at a turn in the high road he made connection with some twenty men of his band 
they rode at us and attempted to scatter us but we drove them aside and kept on after senor zorro we managed to separate him from his fellows and give chase you say he has a score of men fully a score as my men will testify he is a thorn in the flesh of the soldiery but i have sworn to get him and when once we stand face to face you will tell me of it afterward don diego asked rubbing his hands together you will relate how you mocked him as he fought how you played with him pressed him back and ran him through by the sage you make mock of me caballero tis but a jest my sergeant now that we understand each other perhaps fray felipe will give wine to you and your men after such a chase you must be fatigued wine would taste good the sergeant said his corporal came in then to report that the huts and barns had been searched and the corral also and that no trace had been found of senor zorro or his horse fray felipe served the wine though he appeared to do it with some reluctance and it was plain that he was but answering don diego's request and what shall you do now my sergeant don diego asked after the wine had been brought to the table are you always to go chasing around the country and creating a tumult the rogue evidently has turned back toward reina de los angeles caballero the sergeant replied he thinks he is clever no doubt but i can understand his plan ha and what is it he will ride around the reina de los angeles and take the trail to san luis rey he will rest for a time no doubt to throw off all pursuit and then will continue to the vicinity of san juan capistrano that is where he began this wild life of his and for that reason the curse of capistrano he is called yes he will go to capistrano and the soldiers don diego asked we shall follow him leisurely we shall work toward the place and when the news of his next outrage is made known we shall be within a short distance of him instead of in the presidio at the pueblo we can find the fresh trail and so take up the chase there shall be no rest for us until the rogue is either slain or taken prisoner and you have the reward don diego added you speak true words caballero the reward will come in handy but i seek revenge also the rogue disarmed me once ah that was the time he held a pistol in your face and forced you to fight not too well that was the time my good friend oh i have a score to settle with him these turbulent times don diego sighed i would they were at an end a man has no chance for meditation there are moments when i think i shall ride far out in the hills where there can be found no life except rattlesnakes and coyotes and there spend a number of days only in that manner may a man meditate why meditate gonzalez cried why not cease thought and take to action what a man you would make caballero if you let your eye flash now and then and quarrelled a bit and showed your teeth once in a while what you need is a few bitter enemies may the saints preserve us don diego cried it is the truth caballero fight a bit make love to some senorita get drunk wake up and be a man upon my soul you almost persuade me my sergeant but no i never could endure the exertion gonzalez growled something into his great moustache and got up from the table i have no special liking for you fry but i thank you for the wine which was excellent he said we must continue our journey a soldier's duty never is at an end while he lives do not speak of journeys don diego cried i must take one myself on the morrow my business at the hacienda is done and i go back to the pueblo let me express the hope my good friend that you survive the hardship sergeant gonzalez said End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the curse of capistrano by johnston mcculley this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 18 Don Diego Returns Senorita Lolita had to tell her parents, of course, what had happened during their absence, for the despensero knew and would tell Don Diego when he returned, and the senorita was wise enough to realize that it would be better to make the first explanation. The despensero, having been sent for wine, knew nothing of the love scene that had been enacted, and had been told merely that Senor Zorro had hurried away. That seemed reasonable, since the senora was pursued by the soldiers. So the girl told her father and mother that Captain Ramon had called while they were absent, and that he had forced his way into the big living room to speak to her, despite the entreaties of the servant. Perhaps he had been drinking too much wine, else was not himself because of his wound, the girl explained, but he grew too bold and pressed his suit with ardor that was repugnant, and finally insisted that he should have a kiss. Whereupon, said the senorita, this senor Zorro had stepped from the corner of the room, and how he came to be there she did not know, and had forced Captain Ramon to apologize, and then had thrown him out of the house, after which, and here she neglected to tell the entire truth, senor Zorro made a courteous bow and hurried away. Don Carlos was for getting a blade and going at once to the Presidio and challenging Captain Ramon to mortal combat, but Doña Catalina was more calm and showed him that to do that would be to let the world know that their daughter had been affronted, and also it would not aid their fortunes any if Don Carlos quarreled with an officer of the army, and yet again the Don was of an age, and the captain probably would run him through in two passes and leave Doña Catalina a weeping widow, which she did not wish to be so the don paced the floor of the great living-room and fumed and fussed and wished he were ten years the younger or that he had political power again and he promised that when his daughter should have wedded don diego and he was once more in good standing he would see that captain ramon was disgraced and his uniform torn from his shoulders sitting in the chamber that had been assigned to her senorita lolita listened to her father's ravings and found herself confronted with a situation of course she could not wed don diego now she had given her lips and her love to another a man whose face she never had seen, a rogue pursued by soldiery, and she had spoken truly when she had said that a pulido loved but once. She tried to explain it all to herself, saying that it was a generous impulse that had forced her to give her lips to the man, and she told herself that it was not the truth, that her heart had been stirred when first he spoke to her at her father's hacienda during the siesta hour she was not prepared yet to tell her parents of the love that had come into her life for it was sweet to keep it a secret and moreover she dreaded the shock to them and half feared that her father might cause her to be sent away to some place where she never would see senor zorro again she crossed to a window and gazed out at the plaza and she saw don diego approaching in the distance he rode slowly as if greatly fatigued and his two native servants rode a short distance behind him men called to him as he neared the house and he waved his hand at them languidly in response to their greeting he dismounted slowly one of the natives holding the stirrup and assisting him brushed the dust from his clothes and started toward the door Don Carlos and his wife were upon their feet to greet him, their faces beaming, for they had been accepted anew into society the evening before, and knew it was because they were Don Diego's house-guests. "'I regret that I was not here when you arrived,' Don Diego said. "'But I trust that you have been made comfortable in my poor house.' "'More than comfortable in this gorgeous palace,' Don Carlos exclaimed. "'Then you have been fortunate.' for the saints know i have been uncomfortable enough how is that don diego doña catalina asked my work at the hacienda done 
I rode as far as the place of Fray Felipe, there to spend the night in quiet. But as we were about to retire, there came a thundering noise at the door, and this Sergeant Gonzales and a troop of soldiers entered. It appears that they had been chasing the highwayman called Signor Zorro, and had lost him in the darkness. In the other room, a dainty senorita gave thanks for that. These are turbulent times, Don Diego continued, sighing and mopping the perspiration from his forehead. The noisy fellows were with us an hour or more, and then continued the chase, and because of what they had said of violence, I endured a horrible nightmare, so got very little rest and this morning I was forced to continue to Reña de los Angeles. "'You have a difficult time,' Don Carlos said. "'Señor Zorro was here, caballero, in your house, before the soldiers chased him.' "'What is this intelligence?' Don Diego cried, sitting up straight in his chair and betraying sudden interest. "'Undoubtedly he came to steal, else to abduct you and hold you for ransom,' Doña Catalina observed." but I scarcely think that he stole. Don Carlos and myself were visiting friends, and Señorita Lolita remained here alone. There, there is a distressing affair to report to you. I beg of you to proceed, Don Diego said. While we were gone, Captain Ramon of the Presidio called. He was informed we were absent, but he forced his way into the house and made himself obnoxious to the Señorita. This Señor Zorro came in, and forced the captain to apologize, and then drove him away. "'Well, that is what I call a pretty bandit,' Don Diego exclaimed. "'The Señorita suffers from the experience.' "'Indeed, no,' said Doña Catalina. "'She was of the opinion that Captain Ramon had taken too much wine. I shall call her.' Doña Catalina went to the door of the chamber and called her daughter, and Lolita came into the room and greeted Don Diego as became a proper maiden. It makes me desolate to know that she received an insult in my house, Don Diego said. I shall consider the affair. Doña Catalina made a motion to her husband, and they went to a far corner to sit, that the young folk might be somewhat alone, which seemed to please Don Diego, but not the senorita. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of The Curse of Capistrano by Johnston Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 19 Captain Ramon Apologizes Captain Ramon is a beast, the girl said in a voice not too loud. He is a worthless fellow, Don Diego agreed. He, that is, he wished to kiss me she said and you did not let him of course signor i confound it i did not mean that certainly you did not let him i trust that you slapped his face i did said the senorita and then he struggled with me and he told me that i should not be so particular since i was the daughter of a man who stood in the bad graces of the governor why the infernal brute don diego exclaimed is that all you have to say about it, caballero? I cannot use oaths in your presence, of course. You do not understand, senor. This man came into your house and insulted the girl you have asked to be your wife. Confound the rascal. When next I see his excellency, I shall ask him to remove the officer to some other post. Oh! the girl cried. Have you no spirit at all? Have him removed. Were you a proper man, Don Diego, you would go to the presidio. You would call this Captain Ramon to account, you would pass your sword through his body, and call upon all to witness that a man could not insult the senorita you admired, and escape the consequences. It is such an exertion to fight, he said. Let us not speak of violence. Perhaps I shall see the fellow and rebuke him. Rebuke him, the girl cried. Let us talk of something else, senorita. Let us speak of the matter regarding which I talked the other day. My father will be after me again soon to know when I am going to take a wife. 
cannot we get the matter settled in some manner have you decided upon the day i have not said that i would marry you she replied why hold off he questioned have you looked at my house i shall make it satisfactory to you i am sure you shall refurnish it to suit your taste though i pray you do not disturb it too much for i dislike to have things in a mess you shall have a new carriage and anything you may desire is this your manner of wooing she asked glancing at him from the corners of her eyes what a nuisance to woo he said must i play a guitar and make pretty speeches can you not give me your answer without all that foolishness she was comparing this man beside her with senor zorro and don diego did not compare to him favorably she wanted to be done with this farce to have don diego out of her vision and none but senor zorro in it i must speak frankly to you caballero she said i have searched my heart and in it i find no love for you i am sorry for i know what our marriage would mean to my parents and to myself in a financial way but i cannot weigh you don diego and it is useless for you to ask well by the saints i had thought it was about all settled he said do you hear that don carlos your daughter says she cannot wed with me that it is not in her heart to do so lolita retire to your chamber dona catalina exclaimed the girl did so gladly don carlos and his wife hurried across the room and sat down beside don diego i fear you do not understand women my friend don carlos said never must you take a woman's answer for the last she always may change her mind a woman likes to keep a man dangling likes to make him blow cold with fear and hot with anticipation let her have her moods my friend in the end i am sure you will have your way it is beyond me don diego cried what shall i do now i told her i would give her all her heart desired her heart desires love i suppose dona catalina said out of the wealth of her woman's wisdom but certainly i shall love and cherish her does not a man promise that in the ceremony would a vega break his word regarding such a thing just a little courtship don carlos urged but it is such a nuisance a few soft words a pressure of the hand now and then a sigh or two a languishing look from the eyes nonsense is what a maiden expects speak not of marriage for some time let the idea grow on her but my august father is liable to come to the pueblo any day and ask when i am to take a wife he has rather ordered me to do it no doubt your father will understand said don carlos tell him that her mother and myself are on your side and that you are enjoying the pleasure of winning the girl i believe we should return to the hacienda to-morrow dona catalina put in lolita has seen this splendid house and she will contrast it with ours she will realize what it means to marry you and there is an ancient saying that when a man and a maid are apart they grow fonder of each other i do not wish to have you hurry away i think it would be best under the circumstances and do you write out say in three days caballero and i doubt not you will find her more willing to listen to your suit i presume you know best don diego said but you must remain at least until to-morrow and now i think i shall go to the presidio and see this captain ramon possibly that will please the senorita she appears to think i should call him to account don carlos thought that such a course would prove disastrous for a man who did not practice with the blade and knew little of fighting but he refrained from saying so a gentleman never intruded his own thoughts at such a time even if a caballero went to his death it was all right so long as he believed he was doing the proper thing and died as a caballero should so don diego went from the house and walked slowly up the hill toward the presidio building captain ramon observed his approach and wondered at it and snarled at the thought of coming to combat with such a man but he was cold courtesy itself when don diego was ushered into the commandante's office i am proud to know you have visited me here 
he said, bowing low before the scion of the Vegas. Don Diego bowed in answer, and the chair Ramon indicated. The captain marveled that Don Diego had no blade at his side. I was forced to climb your confounded hill to speak to you on a certain matter. Don Diego said, I have been informed that you visited my house during my absence, and insulted a young lady who is my guest. Indeed? The captain said. Were you deep in wine? Senor. That would excuse the offense in part, of course. And then you were wounded, and probably in a fever. Were you in a fever, captain? Undoubtedly. Ramon said. A fever is an awful thing. I had a siege of it once. But you should not have intruded upon the senorita. Not only did you affront her, but you affronted me. I have asked the senorita to become my wife. The matter uh, is not settled as yet, but I have some rights in this case. I entered your house seeking news of this senor Zorro. The captain lied. You uh, found him? Don Diego asked. The face of the comandante flushed red. The fellow was there, and he attacked me. He replied, I was wounded, of course, and wore no weapon, and so he could work his will with me. It is a most remarkable thing, observed Don Diego, that none of you soldiers can meet this curse of Capistrano when you can be on equal terms. Always he descends upon you when you are helpless, or threatens you with a pistol while he fights you with a blade, or has a score of men about him. I met Sergeant Gonzales and his men at the Hacienda of Fray Felipe last night, and the big sergeant told some harrowing tale of the highwayman and his score of men scattering his troopers. We shall get him yet, the captain promised. And I might call your attention to certain significant things, caballero. Don Carlos Pulido, as we know, does not stand high with those in authority. This Senor Zorro was at the Pulido Hacienda, you will remember, and attacked me there emerging from a closet to do it. Ha! Huh. What mean you? Again, on last night, he was in your house while you were abroad and the Pulidos were your guests. It begins to look as if Don Carlos has a hand in the work of the Senor Zorro. I am almost convinced that Don Carlos is a traitor and he is aiding the rogue. You had better think twice, or half a score of times, before seeking a matrimonial alliance with the daughter of such a man. By the saints, what a speech! Don Diego exclaimed, as if in admiration. You have made my poor head ring with it. You really believe all this? I do, caballero. Well, the Polidos are returning to their own place tomorrow, I believe. I but asked them to be my guests so they could be away from the scenes of this Senor Zorro's deeds. And Senor Zorro followed them to the Pueblo, you see. Can it be possible? Don Diego gasped. I must consider the matter. Oh, of these turbulent times! But they are returning to the hacienda tomorrow. Of course I would not have His Excellency think that I harbored a traitor. He got to his feet, bowed courteously, and then stepped slowly toward the door. And there he seemed to remember something suddenly, and turned to face the captain again. Huh, I am at the point of forgetting all about the insult. He exclaimed. What have you to say, my captain, regarding the events of last night? Of course, caballero, I apologize to you most humbly. Captain Ramon replied. I suppose that I must accept your apology. But please do not let such a thing happen again. You frightened my dispensero badly, and he is an excellent servant. Then Don Diego Vega bowed again and left the Presidio, and Captain Ramon laughed long and loudly until the sick men in the hospital room feared that their comandante must have lost his wits. What a man! the captain exclaimed. I have turned him away from that pulido senorita, I think, and I was a fool to hint to the governor that he could be capable of treason. I must rectify th that matter in some way. The man has not enough spirit to be a traitor. End of chapter 19